Chapter Six of the English Governess at the Siamese Court by Anna H. Leon Owens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The King and the Governess. In eighteen twenty five, a royal prince of Siam, his birthright wrested from him and his life imperilled, took refuge in a Buddhist monastery and assumed the yellow garb of a priest. His father, commonly known as Fender Klang, first or supreme king of Siam, had just died, leaving this prince, Chalfa Mongat, at the age of twenty, lawful heir to the crown, for he was the eldest son of the acknowledged queen, and therefore by courtesy and honoured custom, if not by absolute right, the legitimate successor to the throne of the Phra Bats, the golden-footed. But he had an elder half-brother, who through the intrigues of his mother had already obtained control of the royal treasury, and now, with the connivance, if not by the authority, of Senabaudi, the grand council of the kingdom, proclaimed himself king. He had the grace, however, to promise his plundered brother, such royal promises being a cheap form of propitiation in Siam, to hold the reins of government only until Chalfa Mongat should be of years and strength and skill to manage them. But once firmly seated on the throne, the usurper saw in his patient but proud and astute kinsman only a hindrance and a peril in the path of his own cruder and fiercer aspirations. Hence the forewarning and the flight, and the cloister and the yellow robes. And so the usurper continued to reign, unchallenged by any claim from the king that should be, until March, 1851, when a mortal illness having overtaken him, he convoked the grand council of princes and nobles around his couch, and proposed his favourite son as his successor. Then the safe asses of the court kicked the dying lion with seven words of sententious scorn, the crown already has its rightful owner, whereupon the king literally cursed himself to death, for it was almost in the convulsion of a chagrin and rage that he came to his end, on the 3rd of April. In Siam there is no such personage as an heir apparent to the throne, in the definite meaning and positive value which attaches to that phrase in Europe. No prince with an absolute and exclusive title, by birth, adoption, or nomination, to succeed the crown. And while it is true that the eldest living son of a Siamese sovereign by his queen or queen consort is recognized by all custom, ancient and modern, as the probable successor to the high seat of his royal sire, he cannot be said to have a clear and indefeasible right to it, because the question of his accession has yet to be decided by the electing voice of the Senabaudi, in whose judgment he may be ineligible, by reason of certain physical, mental, or moral disabilities, as extreme youth, effeminacy, imbecility, intemperance, profligacy. Nevertheless, the election is popularly expected to result in the choice of the eldest son of the queen, though an interregnum or a regency is a contingency by no means unusual. It was in view of this jurisdiction of the Senabaudi, exercised in deference to a just and honoured usage, that the voice of the oracle fell upon the ear of the dying monarch with the disappointing and offensive significance, for he well knew who was meant by the rightful owner of the crown. Hardly had he breathed his last when, in spite of the busy intrigues of his eldest son, whom we find described in the Bangkok Recorder of July 26, 1866, as most honourable and promising, in spite of the bitter vexation of his lordship Chow Phya Shri Suri Wangsi, so soon to be premier, the prince Chow Phamongat doffed his sacerdotal robes, emerged from his cloister, and was crowned, with the title of Samdesh Phra Paramender Mahamangat, Duke and Royal Bearer of the Great Crown. For twenty-five years had the true heir to the throne of the Prabats, patiently biding his time, lain perdu in his monastery, diligently devoting himself to the study of Sanskrit, Pali, theology, history, geology, chemistry, and especially astronomy. He had been a familiar visitor at the houses of the American missionaries, two of whom, Dr. House and Mr. Mattoon, were, throughout his reign and life, gratefully revered by him for that pleasant and profitable converse, which helped to unlock to him the secrets of European vigour and advancement, and to make straight and easy the paths of knowledge he had started upon. Not even the essential arrogance of his Siamese nature could prevent him from accepting cordially the happy influences these good and true men inspired, and doubtless he would have gone more than half-way to meet them, but for the dazzle of the golden throne in the distance, which arrested him midway between Christianity and Buddhism, between truth and delusion, between light and darkness, between life and death. 
In the Oriental tongues this progressive king was eminently proficient, and toward priests, preachers, and teachers of all creeds, sects, and sciences, an enlightened exemplar of tolerance. It was likewise his peculiar vanity to pass for an accomplished English scholar, and to this end he maintained in his palace at Bangkok a private printing establishment, with fonts of the English type, which, as may be perceived presently, he was at no loss to keep in copy. Perhaps it was the printing office which suggested, quite naturally, an English governess for the élite of his wives and concubines, and their offspring, in number amply adequate to the constitution of a royal school, and in material most attractively fresh and romantic. Happy thought! Wherefore, behold me, just after sunset on a pleasant day in April, 1862, on the threshold of the outer court of the Grand Palace, accompanied by my own brave little boy, and escorted by a compatriot. A flood of light sweeping through the spacious hall of audience displayed a throng of noblemen in waiting. None turned a glance, or seemingly a thought, on us, and my child, being tired and hungry, I urged Captain B. to present us without delay. At once we mounted the marble steps, and entered the brilliant hall unannounced. Ranged on the carpet were many prostrate, mute, and motionless forms, over whose heads to step was a temptation as drolly natural as it was dangerous. His Majesty spied us quickly, and advanced abruptly, petulantly screaming, "'Who? Who? Who?' Captain B., who, by the way, is a titled nobleman of Siam, introduced me as the English governess, engaged for the royal family. The King shook hands with us, and immediately proceeded to march up and down in quick step, putting one foot before the other with mathematical precision, as if under drill. "'Forewarned, forearmed,' my friend whispered, that I should prepare myself for a sharp cross-questioning as to my age— my husband, children, and other strictly personal concerns. Suddenly His Majesty, having cogitated sufficiently in his peculiar manner, with one long final stride, halted in front of us, and pointing straight at me with his forefinger, asked, "'How old shall you be?' Scarcely able to repress a smile at a proceeding so absurd, and with my sex distaste for so serious a question, I demurely replied, "'One hundred and fifty years old.' Had I made myself much younger, he might have ridiculed or assailed me. But now he stood surprised and embarrassed for a few moments, then resumed his queer march, and at last, beginning to perceive the jest, coughed, laughed, coughed again, and in a high, sharp key asked, "'In what year were you born?' Instantly I struck a mental balance, and answered, as gravely as I could, "'In 1788.' At this point the expression of His Majesty's face was indescribably comical. Captain B. slipped behind a pillar to laugh, but the king only coughed, with a significant emphasis that startled me, and addressed a few words to his prostrate courtiers, who smiled at the carpet, all except the Prime Minister, who turned to look at me. But His Majesty was not to be baffled so. Again he marched with vigour, and then returned to the attack with Elan. "'How many years shall you be married?' "'For several years, Your Majesty.' He fell into a brown study, then laughing, rushed at me, and demanded triumphantly, "'Ha! How many grandchildren shall you now have? Ha, ha! How many? Ha, ha, ha! Of course we all laughed with him, but the general hilarity admitted of a variety of constructions. Then suddenly he seized my hand and dragged me, nolon volant, my little Louis holding fast by my skirt, through several sombre passages, along which crouched duennas, shriveled and grotesque, and many youthful women, covering their faces, as if blinded by the splendour of the passing majesty. At length he stopped before one of the many curtained recesses, and, drawing aside the hangings, disclosed a lovely, childlike form. He stooped and took her hand, she naively hiding her face, and, placing it in mine, said, "'This is my wife, the Lady Talap. She desires to be educated in English. She is as pleasing for her talents as for her beauty, and it is our pleasure to make her a good English scholar. You shall educate her for me.' I replied that the office would give me much pleasure, for nothing could be more eloquently winning than the modest, timid bearing of that tender young creature in the presence of her lord. She laughed low and pleasantly as he translated my sympathetic words to her, and seemed so enraptured with the graciousness of his act that I took my leave of her with a sentiment of profound pity. He led me back by the way we had come, and now we met many children, who put my patient boy to much childish torture for the gratification of their startled curiosity. I have sixty-seven children, said His Majesty, when we had returned to the audience hall. You shall educate them, and as many of my wives likewise, as may wish to learn English. And I have much correspondence in which you must assist me. 
and moreover I have much difficulty for reading and translating French letters, for French are fond of using gloomily deceiving terms. You must undertake, and you shall make all their murky sentences and gloomy deceiving propositions clear to me. And furthermore I have by every mail foreign letters whose writing is not easily read by me. You shall copy on round hand, for my readily perusal thereof. Nil desperatum! But I began by despairing of my ability to accomplish tasks so multifarious. I simply bowed, however, and so dismissed myself for that evening. One tempting morning, when the air was cool, my boy and I ventured some distance beyond the bounds of our usual cautious promenade, close to the palace of the premier. Some forty or fifty carpenters, building boats under a long, low shed, attracted the child's attention. We tarried a while, watching their work, and then strolled to a stone bridge hard by, where we found a gang of repulsive wretches, all men, coupled by means of iron collars and short but heavy fetters, in which they moved with difficulty, if not with positive pain. They were carrying stone from the canal to the bridge, and as they stopped to deposit their burdens, I observed that most of them had hard, defiant faces, though here and there there were sad and gentle eyes that bespoke sympathy. One of them approached us, holding out his hand, into which Boy dropped the few coins he had. Instantly, with a greedy shout, the whole gang were upon us, crowding us on all sides, wrangling, yelling. I was exceedingly alarmed, and having no more money there, knew not what to do, except to take my child in my arms, and strive again and again to break through the press. But still I fell back baffled, and sickened by the insufferable odours that emanated from their disgusting persons. And still they pressed, and scrambled, and screamed, and clanked their horrid chains. But behold, suddenly, as if struck by lightning, every man of them fell on his face, and officers flew among them pell-mell, swinging with hard, heavy thongs the naked, wincing backs. It was with a sense of infinite relief that we found ourselves safe in our rooms at last, but the breakfast tasted earthy, and the atmosphere was choking, and our very hearts were parched. At night Boy lay burning on his little bed, moaning for Ayer Sojuk, cool water, while I fainted for a breath of fresh, sweet air. But God blesses these eastern prison-houses not at all. The air that visits them is no better than the life within, heavy, stifling, stupefying. For relief I betook me to the study of the Siamese language, an occupation I had found very pleasant and inspiring. As for Boy, who spoke Malay fluently, it was wonderful with what aptness he acquired it. When next I interviewed the King, I was accompanied by the Premier's sister, a fair and friendly woman, whose whole stock of English was, "'Good morning, sir,' and with this somewhat irreverent greeting, a dozen times in an hour, though the hour were night, she relieved her pent-up feelings, and gave expression to her sympathy in regard to me. Mr. Hunter, private secretary to the Premier, had informed me, speaking for His Excellency, that I should prepare to enter upon my duties at the Royal Palace without delay. Accordingly, next morning the elder sister of the Kralahome came for us. She led the way to the river, followed by slave-girls bearing a gold teapot, a pretty gold tray containing two tiny porcelain cups with covers, her betel-box, also of gold, and two large fans. When we were seated in the closely covered basket-boat, she took up one of the books I had brought with me, and turning over the leaves, came upon the alphabet, whereat, with a look of pleased surprise, she began repeating the letters. I helped her, and for a while she seemed amused and gratified, but presently, growing weary of it, she abruptly closed the book, and offering me her hand, said, "'Good morning, sir.' I replied with equal cordiality, and I think we bade each other good morning at least a dozen times before we reached the palace. We landed at a showy pavilion, and after traversing several covered passages came to a barrier guarded by Amazons, to whom the old lady was evidently well known, for they threw open the gate for us, and squatted till we passed. A hot walk of twenty minutes brought us to a curious oval door of polished brass, which opened and shut noiselessly in a highly ornate frame. This admitted us to a cool retreat, on one side of which were several temples or chapels in antique styles, and on the other a long dim gallery. On the marble floor of this pavilion a number of interesting children sat or sprawled, and quaint babies slept or frolicked in their nurses' arms. It was indeed a grateful change from the oppressive, irritating heat and glare through which we had just passed. The loungers started up to greet our motherly guide, who humbly prostrated herself before them, and then refreshments were brought in on large silver trays, with covers of scarlet silk in the form of a beehive. As no knife or fork or spoon was visible, 
Boy and I were fain to content ourselves with oranges, wherewith we made ourselves an unexpected but cheerful show for the entertainment and edification of these juvenile spectators of the royal family of Siam. I smiled and held out my hand to them, for they were, almost without exception, attractive children, but they shyly shrank from me. Meanwhile the child-wife, to whom His Majesty had presented me at my first audience, appeared, and after saluting profoundly the sister of the Kralaholm, and conversing with her for some minutes, lay down on the cool floor, and using her betel-box for a pillow, beckoned to me. As I approached and seated myself beside her, she said, "'I am very glad to see you. It is long time I not see. Why you come so late?' To all of which she evidently expected no reply. I tried baby-talk, in the hope of making my amiable sentiments intelligible to so infantile a creature, but in vain. Seeing me disappointed and embarrassed, she oddly sang a scrap of the Sunday-school hymn, There is a happy land, far, far away, and then said, I think of you very often, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This meritorious but disjointed performance was followed by a protracted and trying silence, I sitting patient, and boy wondering in my lap. At last she half rose, and looking around, cautiously whispered, Dear Mamma Toon, I love you, I think of you. Your boy dead, you come to palace, you cry, I love you. And laying her finger on her lips, and her head on the betel box again, again she sang, There is a happy land, far, far away. Mrs. Mattoon is the wife of that good and true American apostle who has nobly served the cause of missions in Siam as a co-laborer with the excellent Dr. Samuel House. While the wife of the latter devoted herself indefatigably to the improvement of schools for the native children, whom the mission had gathered round it, Mrs. Mattoon shared her labors by occasionally teaching in the palace, which was for some time thrown open to the ladies of her faithful sisterhood. Here as elsewhere, the blended force and gentleness of her character wrought marvels in the impressionable and grateful minds to which she had access. So spontaneous and ingenious a tribute of reverence and affection from a pagan to a Christian lady was inexpressibly charming to me. Thus the better part of the day passed. The longer I rested, dreaming there, the more enchanted seemed the world within those walls. I was aroused by a slight noise proceeding from the covered gallery, whence an old lady appeared bearing a candlestick of gold, with branches supporting four lighted candles. I afterward learned that these were daily offerings, which the king, on awakening from his forenoon slumber, sent to the Wat Phra Khu. This apparition was the signal for much stir. The lady Talap started to her feet and fled, and we were left alone with the premier's sister and the slaves-in-waiting. The entire household seemed to awake on the instant, as in the sleeping palace of Tennyson, at the kiss of the fairy prince. The maid and page renewed their strife, the palace banged and buzzed and clapped, and all the pent-up stream of life dashed downward in a cataract. A various procession of women and children, some pale and downcast, others bright and blooming, more moody and hardened, moved in the one direction. None tarried to chat, none loitered or looked back, the Lord was awake. And at last with these the king awoke, and in his chair and in his chair himself upreared, and yawned and rubbed his face, and spoke. Presently the child wife reappeared, arrayed now in dark blue silk, which contrasted well with the soft olive of her complexion, and quickly followed the others, with a certain anxious alacrity expressed in her baby face. I readily guessed that His Majesty was the awful cause of all this careful bustle, and began to feel uneasy myself, as my ordeal approached. For an hour I stood on thorns. Then there was a general frantic rush. Attendants, nurses, slaves, vanished through doors, around corners, behind pillars, under staircases, and at last, preceded by a sharp, cross cough, behold the king! We found His Majesty in a less genial mood than at my first reception. He approached us coughing loudly and repeatedly, a sufficiently ominous fashion of announcing himself, which greatly discouraged my darling boy, who clung to me anxiously. He was followed by a numerous trail of women and children, who formerly prostrated themselves around him. Shaking hands with me coldly, but remarking upon the beauty of the child's hair, half buried in the folds of my dress, he turned to the premier's sister, and conversed at some length with her, she apparently acquiescing in all that he had to say. He then approached me, and said, in a loud and domineering tone, It is our pleasure that you shall reside within this palace with our family. I replied that it would be quite impossible for me to do so, 
that being as yet unable to speak the language, and the gates being shut every evening, I should feel like an unhappy prisoner in the palace. "'Where do you go every evening?' he demanded. "'Not anywhere, Your Majesty. I am a stranger here. Then why you shall object to the gates being shut?' I do not clearly know, I replied, with a secret shudder at the idea of sleeping within those walls. But I am afraid I could not do it. I beg your majesty will remember that in your gracious letter you promised me a residence adjoining the royal palace, not within it. He turned and looked at me, his face growing almost purple with rage. I do not know I have promised. I do not know former condition. I do not know anything but you are our servant, and it is our pleasure that you must live in this palace, and you shall obey." These last three words he fairly screamed. I trembled in every limb, and for some time I knew not how to reply. At length I ventured to say, I am prepared to obey all your Majesty's commands within the obligation of my duty to your family, but beyond that I can promise no obedience. You shall live in palace, he roared, you shall live in palace. I will give women slaves to wait on you. You shall commence royal school in this pavilion on Thursday next. That is the best day for such undertaking, in the estimation of our astrologers. With that he addressed, in a frantic manner, commands, unintelligible to me, to some of the old women about the pavilion. My boy began to cry, tears filled my own eyes, and the premier's sister, so kind but an hour before, cast fierce glances at us both. I turned and led my child toward the oval brass door. We heard voices behind us crying, "'Ma'am! Ma'am!' I turned again, and saw the king beckoning and calling to me. I bowed to him profoundly, but passed on through the brass door. The Prime Minister's sister bounced after us in a distraction of excitement, tugging at my cloak, shaking her finger in my face, and crying, "'My dee! My dee!' Footnote. Bad! Bad! All the way back, in the boat, and on the street, to the very door of my apartments, instead of her jocund, "'Good morning, sir,' I had nothing but, "'My dee!' But kings, who are not mad, have their sober second thoughts like other rational people. His golden-footed majesty presently repented him of his arbitrary cantankerousness, and in due time my ultimatum was accepted. End of chapter 6 Read by Sibella Denton